Christmas is taking on a new significance in this most unusual of years. How can we celebrate Christmas safely? And what are the elements that we most want to preserve? The name Dickens, the adjective Dickensian, and the character name Scrooge have all been in the news in the run-up to Christmas, with governments being portrayed as miserly Scrooges, and the prospect of children going hungry, evoking images of Oliver asking for more. Many modern Christmas celebrations can be traced back either directly to Dickens and his works, or else to the time when Dickens was active. The Christmas tree was introduced to Britain in the early 1840s by Prince Albert. The Christmas card was invented by Henry Cole in 1843. And Santa Claus, or Father Christmas, gradually evolved and developed from a variety of sources during the mid-century. However, the identification of Dickens with Christmas was so strong that according to the oft-repeated story, when Dickens' death in June 1870 was broadcast by newsboys in Covent Garden Market, a little apple seller was heard to exclaim in despair, then will Father Christmas die too? Dickens featured Christmas prominently in his first picaresque novel, The Pickwick Papers, with a scene characterised by plentiful food, good humour and companionship, plus liberal quantities of alcohol, in the idyllic setting of Dingley Dell. But it was, of course, the 1843 novella, A Christmas Carol, which fixed Dickens in the public's imagination as Mr. Christmas, the personification of goodwill to all. Much has been written about the immediate motivations behind Dickens' ghostly moral tale, his wish to highlight the iniquity of child labour in a palatable rather than a didactic format, as well as the need to revive his flagging popularity after sales of his latest novel, Martin Chuzzlewit, had started to drop off badly. Once the author hit on the theme and structure of the carol, Dickens wrote the tale in a six-week burst of inspiration, and his pretty little five-shilling gift book, decorated on the cover with a winter wreath, went on sale on December the 19th, 1843. The 6,000 copies printed sold out almost immediately, and A Christmas Carol has, ever since, been one of the best-loved and perhaps the best-known literary story in the English language. Bearing that in mind, I won't rehash the plot, but cut straight to the chase and say that I believe that I have unearthed a new source for Dickens' Christmas tale, based on my work as a literary detective. Let's be quite clear that before the Victorian era, Christmas had fallen quite out of fashion and was barely celebrated at all in most parts of Britain. After its heyday in Elizabethan times, the Puritan Oliver Cromwell had gone so far as to ban it, and only a few antiquarians were concerned with wishing to revive ancient Christmas customs. One of these was the giving of gifts, and in the late 1820s, seasonal anthologies of new writing were published, intended as Christmas presents. And one such work was entitled The Winter's Wreath, this being the collection for 1830. I came upon this copy in an antiquarian bookshop in Tübingen, Germany, when attending a Dickens conference in 2018. Imagine my surprise and delight when, looking through the contents pages, I found a poem by H.F. Chorley entitled A Christmas Carol. The poem is in seven stanzas or staves, and features a number of elements which I think will be familiar to readers of Dickens's prose carol. In the second verse, we encounter a personification of Christmas. See on the winter's frosty path a jocund form appear, and with the tabor and the horn, his brows with yew and holly bound, lo, Christmas comes, his eldest born, with voice that laugheth care to scorn, and scatters mirth around. In Dickens's tale, we can clearly recognise this figure as being the jolly green giant who is the ghost of Christmas present. The poem immediately continues in the following stanza with a series of buzzwords that will definitely make Dickens fans and scholars take note. Lo, Christmas comes, that household word to English bosoms dear, and memory, by its magic stirred, retraces many a year. Of course, Dickens' weekly journal, in which many of his later writings on the theme of Christmas were published, was entitled Household Words. And it is precisely at Christmas that, by magic, Scrooge's memory is stirred to retrace the lost years of his youth. The poet then evokes old customs, feasting, 
dancing and goodwill, but also introduces ghostly elements, and some there be who sit apart and while the hours of night with tales that curdle every heart of goblin and of sprite. Dickens introduced a goblin tale in the Christmas section of Pickwick, and the whole of A Christmas Carol is a story of sprites and spirits set during the night before Christmas. The poet dismisses those who want to ignore Christmas, the bah humbug misery mongers, and indeed proclaims in the last verse that he will sing his worthiest strain, Old Christmas in thy praise, like the reformed Scrooge wishing everyone he meets a hearty Merry Christmas. Of course, these similarities could be no more than coincidence, and I have no firm evidence that Dickens was actually familiar with this poem. However, let me continue to make my case. In 1830, when The Winter's Wreath was still a new work, Dickens was 18 and began actively courting his first great love, Maria Beadnell. What better Christmas gift for his new love than this pretty little volume of stories and poems. And so far I've said nothing about the poet responsible for A Christmas Carol, designated as H.F. Chorley. His full name was Henry Fothergill Chorley, one of several writers from a prominent Lancashire Quaker family. He produced volumes of poetry, plays, novels and librettos, but was best known as the music and literary critic for the Athenaeum, a position he occupied with distinction for almost 40 years. He's also known, however, by association as one of Charles Dickens's oldest and closest friends. Chorley wrote for Household Words and All the Year Round and even penned a glowing review of Dickens's Christmas Carol for the Athenaeum on the novella's first appearance in 1843. I have in my collection a newly discovered note from Dickens to Marcus Stone, inviting him down to Gad's Hill for Christmas 1866 in which Dickens says that if Stone catches a certain train, he should share the journey with Chorley and Layard, who were also spending Christmas with Dickens and his family. In the posthumously published memoirs of Henry Chorley, there's a long letter to the volume's editor from Dickens' eldest daughter, Mamie, in which she recalls the enormous pleasure that Chorley derived from that and many other family Christmases. He was always ready for any game, charade, or impromptu amusement of any sort, and was capital at it. She goes on to say that, I believe he loved my father better than any man in the world, was grateful to him for his friendship, and truly proud of possessing it, which he certainly did to a very large amount. My father was very fond of him, and had the greatest respect for his honest, straightforward, upright, and generous character. I think and I'm very glad to think that the happiest days of Mr Chorley's life were passed at Gad's Hill. One wonders if Chorley's love for Dickens and his generosity of character extended to overlooking, or even tacitly approving, certain possibly unconscious borrowings for an obscure, youthful poem of his entitled A Christmas Carol, which Dickens then incorporated into his immortal carol. Merry Christmas, everyone! Gone rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Blah! Humbug!